Okay, welcome back to the channel and in today's video we are talking about the best fashion moment of 2021. Now it goes without saying, of course there will be some moments I miss out because I don't want this video to go on for too long. So if there's anything you feel like I missed out or any fashion moment that you sort of remember when you think of 2021, then don't hesitate to comment that in the section down below. <laughs> So in July, Balenciaga launched their 50th Couture collection, which was actually a monumental fashion moment. This was actually the first Couture collection showcased by the house since 1967, when the founder, Christopher Balenciaga himself, left the fashion industry. Balenciaga actually restored the original Couture salon that Christopher himself used to accept clients into. This as a location is very symbolic to the house and it also shows Demna's respect for the heritage of the House of Balenciaga. However, Demna Vesalia's collection with Balenciaga for Couture was quite different from what we would expect of a Balenciaga Couture collection. We had the beautiful hats and the sharp tailoring that we always associate Christopher Balenciaga's work with. We saw cocoon silhouettes, we saw the hourglass silhouettes, we saw balloon silhouettes. But another thing we did see was a lot of jeans, we saw knits, we saw windbreakers, and we even saw a t-shirt. When asked about this in interviews, Demna Vesalia said he wanted to elevate themes of casual dressing. And I think this is something that Demna Vesalia has always done in his work, whether we're thinking about when he was at Vetmore or now at Balenciaga, he's always asking questions with his work. In this case, he's asking questions on what exactly is couture? What, what can be couture and what is modern couture? What is couture that is relevant to, you know, today's fashion landscape? That's why we saw looks that are a mixture of women and men's looks, whereas before, you would only associate Chris Balenciaga's work, a couture show, with only having women's look. To quote what Demna Vesalia said in an interview with Vogue, he said, it puts the person, the wearer, on a pedestal almost. That's what couture is for me. It's taking a mundane type of product out of the contemporary fashion wardrobe and making it special. Doing that through the material, through craftsmanship, through construction, through the silhouette and all of that. People put me in a box of someone who designs hoodies and sneakers, and that's not really who I am. I really wanted to show who I am as a designer, considering the legacy of the house that I'm lucky enough to have here. And of course, just the Couture show being a monumental moment, just the fact that this is another way that, you know, people can see Demna Vesalia's work. Of course, I feel like people that are into fashion know that Demna Vesalia is very skilled. Of course, Balenciaga has a whole atelier. That being said, when the average person thinks of Balenciaga, they think of what Demna has done, has made the brand financially successful. So they think of things like the Triple S, they think of the hoodies, they think of, you know, the jackets, they think of the sock sneakers, they think of all those track sneakers and all the different things that Demna has done has made the brand very successful. And so it was great to have this couture show and Demna Vesalia's first couture show with Balenciaga because it's another showcase of his skill and his design ethos and even when it came to the looks that were the jeans, the jeans were made in Japan of course, that's the height of you know high quality denim or the the hoodies and things were lined with cashmere so even the most basic things, once again he's reinterpreting what we think couture is and he's elevating it whether that's in terms of fabrics and that's something that he said in an interview with Vogue. For the finale of the collection, we saw a veiled bridal look and this was actually an ode to one of Chris Balenciaga's last designs that was presented many, many years ago. And like I said earlier, we could see Chris Balenciaga's DNA throughout um, the Couture collection, which was really nice. The next big fashion moment we saw was Joe Biden's inauguration as the 46th President of the United States of America. It was a political event, but quite quickly became a showcase for emerging American talent. Lady Gaga will famously be remembered wearing a custom Scaparelli gown designed by American designer Daniel Rosebery. And this was a big moment, not only because of the presidential event, which is obviously big in history, not only because Daniel Rosebery is an emerging talent in America, as far as fashion goes, but also because Scaparelli this year had a meteoric rise. And this is, because this happened at the start of the year, this happened in January, and this sort of set the tone for how well Scaparelli's year was and how many people 
um, sort of learnt what Scaparelli is this year. Because unless you're into fashion, you would never really have heard of Scaparelli before Lady Gaga wore it. Because the fashion house was founded in 1927 by Elsa Scaparelli, but the brand was closed in the 1950s. Now there have been some companies that have bought the Scaparelli brand and tried to revive it and it's been very unsuccessful. But after a few tries, I think Daniel Rosebery has the perfect formula and it seems to be working with him as the creative director. Scaparelli is historically one of the most influential and iconic fashion brands in fashion history. And yeah, it was just really good to see another Scaparelli moment because I, I just like that these brands that have been sort of dormant for so many years and are so important to fashion history are now coming back into the fore. I really like that. Now, I won't go into Scaparelli's work because it's so, there's so many things to talk about, surrealism, futurism, there's too many things to talk about. But I have a book recommendation. So if you, you don't know much about Scaparelli's work, uh, this is a good book um, to read to get started. It's Vogue on Elsa Scaparelli by Judith Watt. Um, it's, you can find it online. You'll be able to find it online. I'll see if I can leave a link to it in the description below. Kamala Harris was also seen wearing a purple tailored coat and dress by another emerging American designer, Christopher John Rogers. Although considering how many awards Christopher John Rogers has won recently, can we call him emerging? Or is he like an established designer now? I guess you guys can decide. But another funny and unexpected fashion moment from the inauguration was the thing that became the famous Bernie Sanders meme with him, you know, sat crossing his legs with his mittens. And funny enough, it quickly became something that went from a meme to actually focusing on the woman that makes the mittens. And that was a whole big story. And I, I do like that she's supporting a good cause. The next big fashion moment was Gucci's 100 year anniversary collection, the Gucci Aria collection. So if you're unaware, Gucci turned 100 this year and they celebrated it with a collection titled Aria. The collection actually featured some looks and pieces from iconic moments throughout the brand's history. We saw things from the Tom Ford era when he was the creative director of Gucci. We saw the red velvet tuxedo from fall 1996. We saw Frida Giannini furs. We also saw things as far back as an ode to the work of Guccio Gucci, the founder, who embarked into the world of fashion after being inspired by the lifestyle of the upper class individuals he served at the Savoy Hotel. That's why we see the horse bit detailing, we saw the jockey hats and many more pieces. But I think what came as a bigger surprise was what they have described as the hack, where people have been calling it collaboration, but they're like, no, in interviews and, press releases, they're like, no, don't call it a collaboration, it's a hack, so I guess we'll go with that. But sort of this fusion of, you know, Balenciaga silhouettes with Gucci prints or Gucci products with Balenciaga prints. This is something I personally didn't see coming at all. It's extremely rare that two massive fashion brands of the scale of Balenciaga and Gucci actually work with each other. But it wasn't really an impossible move, considering that Gucci and Balenciaga are owned by the same French corporation, Kering. I think the strategy for it was quite good because it's part of the reason why the 100 year anniversary collection will be so memorable. Like I can imagine 10 years from now, it's definitely not something I'll forget. I'll be talking with my friends um, about fashion and we'll be like, oh yeah, do you remember that collection when, you know, Gucci and Balenciaga, they hacked each other. And it's funny because in a later collection, Balenciaga hacked Gucci. And I think it was in the clones collection that Balenciaga hacked Gucci. And I think that set a precedent for a lot of fashion collaborations we saw this year, including the next big fashion moment of 2021, which is Fendace. As the name suggests, Fendace was a collaboration between Fendi and Versace. For this collection, Donatella Versace and Kim Jones switched roles, which means that Kim Jones was designing his vision of Versace and Donatella Versace was designing her vision of Fendi. This is another one of those things where they're like, don't call it a collaboration. And instead in press releases, they just said that it was just a celebration of their friendship through a collection, essentially. I don't know what this obsession is with not calling it collaboration, but it's something I will get onto much later. The casting of The Runaway Show was a big talking point with huge names like Naomi Campbell, Kate Moss, and Amber Valletta, who of course are OGs of the Versace story. But yeah, I think this obsession with all these brands saying don't call it a collaboration, I think is that they're, they're avoiding criticism because I mean, 
Yes, we appreciate that these are big moments like Fendi and Versace or Gucci and Balenciaga, but in terms of like the collaboration themselves, not that much work went into the collaboration. They are literally already existing Balenciaga silhouettes with a Gucci print or that no work needs to be done to do that. And I think that they can avoid people saying, oh, this is trash. Like, how can this be a collaboration by just saying, oh no, it's a hack or turning it into something comical or funny. Personally, I see right past it. And especially the Fendace collection, I think a lot of the pieces were a bit tacky. And then the rest of the looks that weren't a terrible mismatch of logos and prints was sort of an ode to Versace collections from the mid nineties, which I actually did like. Um, but apart from that, the, the logo matching, it, the, yeah, that wasn't, yeah. What you're looking at on the screen, no. And it's weird because I've been talking to a lot of my um, fashion friends and a, a lot of what they have said is that, isn't Versace supposed to be tacky? But to me, Versace isn't tacky. To me, Versace is sexy. Versace, when I think of Versace, I think of a brand that always wanted to celebrate the the female form. That's what I think when I think Versace. At times it can be kitsch, but I definitely wouldn't call it tacky. But either way, whether I personally liked it or not, I still think it was a huge fashion moment. And once again, Balenciaga, Gucci, Fendi, Versace, these are not things that we have seen and you typically see happening in the fashion industry at all. The next big fashion moment of 2021, and this was a huge one, was the fact that Phoebe Philo announced the launching of her eponymous fashion label. Phoebe Philo, a woman who is known for her time at Chloe and Celine, Celine with an accent, by the way, changed a lot of women's wardrobes through her clean, minimalistic style. Phoebe Philo is one of those designers with a cult following and they even have a name called the Philo Files. And since she left Celine in 2017 to take a break on fashion and to focus on other things, people have been itching for her to make a return in fashion, which is why it came with a lot of excitement when Phoebe Philo announced, of course, she was launching her label. And it's also backed partially um, with a minority stake by LVMH, which makes a lot of sense because Phoebe Philo, when she was working at Celine, of course, it's owned by LVMH. She made them a lot of money. They've built a good relationship. There's also financial gain that they can have because they've seen her at work, they know how successful she can be. And so it was just quite interesting. And of course we haven't really seen much from the brand since it was announced, um, but I'm looking forward to what Phoebe Philo does. I remember when Phoebe Philo left Celine and there were all these articles that were like, well, if you miss Phoebe Philo's work at Celine, here are some designers that make similar work. And then they put people like Peter Doe and Daniel Lee. I really don't think Peter Doe's work looks similar to um, Phoebe Philo's. I think Daniel Lee more so, but even then it's still a bit different. I don't think Peter Doe and Daniel Lee are direct replacements for Phoebe Philo just because they worked for her. I think that's a connection that sometimes is a bit forced. To quote what Phoebe Philo said about making a return to fashion, she said, being in my studio and making once again has been both exciting and incredibly fulfilling. I'm very much looking forward to being back in touch with my audience and people everywhere. To be independent, to govern and to experiment on my own terms is hugely significant to me. I have had a very constructive and creative working relationship with LVMH for many years. So it is a natural progression for us to reconnect on this new project. Now talking about Peter Doe, he actually has the next big fashion moment of 2021 because he launched his debut show at New York Fashion Week. Now Peter Doe is an emerging designer based in New York that has been gradually rising to success in fashion through his structured tailoring silhouettes that bring masculine elements into a wardrobe for women. If you want to learn more about Peter Doe's work, I've actually made a video about the brand that you should definitely check out. However, the brand never really did runway shows because Peter Doe said in prior interviews that he felt the brand wasn't really ready and he didn't want to have a show just for the sake of having a show. Which is why it came as a very pleasant surprise when he announced that he was going to have his debut show at New York Fashion Week, which debuted a few months ago. This was obviously highly anticipated because Peter Doe has been a buzzing name in fashion now. Of course, there's a Phoebe Philo connection because he worked for her. And just in general, the brand now has a big following. It's worn by many different celebrities. Zendaya has worn Peter Doe and Zendaya this year has sort of become 
a fashion icon. So the brand is definitely quite popular, especially on social media. And like I said earlier, the brand has showcased quite a few collections. In interviews with Peter Doe and his team, you get the sense that in the studio, there's this community feel. I was listening to a podcast of Peter Doe um, on the cutting room floor by Rachel Mondi, and he was talking about how they sort of make food for each other in the studio and there's that sort of cultural feel as well. That's why I really like that he went back to his Vietnamese origins for this collection. This even started from the location because the runway show was held on the Brooklyn waterfront, which was a nod to what Peter Doe describes as the point of arrival for, you know, the parents of an immigrant coming to the US. He also wanted this collection to be a bit pared back. And so we saw the brand's signatures, like the pleating and the different interesting fabrics that Peter Doe likes to use. But there were sort of slight changes. The fabrics were a bit lighter and the tailoring was a bit softer. I like how the Starfall came out at the end, um, at the finale. And it's just, yeah, it's a very Peter Doe thing for the whole group to come out. I've always said that I don't like it that creative directors take all the credit um, when it comes to designing because so many things happen. Like, I mean, the framework of how the industry works, a creative director does not just sit there and come up with all the ideas, especially at big brands. Creative directors have all these different interns and people that do research for them and they bring the research to the creative director. Then the creative director chooses sort of what they like they might put their own input and there's so many things at play that can create a successful collection. The people working at the atelier, the machinists, the pattern makers. Yeah, it's just, I just think it's a bit disingenuous that like we always just only praise the creative director and the creative director just comes alone and takes a bow like, yeah, it was me, it was all my work. I don't know, it just doesn't sit right with me. And so I like it when people like Peter Doe do these sort of things or what people like Marton Magella used to do. Now, the last fashion moment I'm going to talk about is Pieter Mulier's debut for A Liar, which is definitely one of my favorite moments. Um, definitely something I was looking forward to when it first happened and something that when I think of the big fashion moments in 2021, it's definitely something that constantly comes to my mind. So Millier was actually the first to have been trusted to be the creative director of the house since the unfortunate passing of Azadina Laya himself in 2017. Now before Millier became creative director, it was just the tight-knit team working on the collections. This is a team that has been working with Alaya many years prior, so they understand Alaya, and that was sort of the team that was coming together to create the collection. This kind of, this moment, it, it reminds me of people like Daniel Rosebery at Scaparelli because I think Mulier, I think, is going to do a really good job reintroducing a liar to a younger audience. I think that's what Daniel Rosebery has done successfully. And it's just because when I, when I think of the work of Azadina Liar, I think of, um, I think of sexiness. When I, when I think of really, really sexy clothing, I think of Versace, in terms of Gianni Versace, who I think is really underrated in terms of like how he could really sculpt a dress to a woman's body. Alaya did the same thing. It's just the way they executed it was very different. Alaya, oh my gosh, she is like a like an architect with the woman's form. It's crazy. I think why I'm a big fan of Azadine Alaya is because I'm a really big fan of Madeleine Vionnet. And I remember when I was first learning about fashion and I learned about how um, Madeleine Vionnet used to use like bias cuts. And Azadine Alaya, of course, being heavily inspired by Madeleine Vionnet, he used to study her work, uses sort of very similar techniques. And that's why when it came to like the fit of Alaya's stuff. It is insane. Another thing that Eli used to do was the way he would use leather. Like we even saw in this Moulier collection, sort of the, the leather belt corset tree. That's a very Eli thing. Um, even just in general, the silhouettes we saw across this collection, very Eli. But I think where, I don't want to sound like, um, oh, fashion is dying. But what I remember when I was first getting into fashion, and I know I'd, I've become so enthusiastic all of a sudden, but when I first got into fashion, I was learning about these like insane designers, like people like Scaparelli and Cristobal Balenciaga and Charles James and Paul Poiré. The, these are designers that, Carl, even Karl Lagerfeld, these are designers that are so skilled. Yves Saint Laurent, so skilled, so damn skilled. 
And it's like, we're kind of losing that now. I get it. Like, if you have an atelier, you can find someone that sews. But I think there's a certain type of perfection that comes from designers that are real serious tailors and sculptors and drapers. People like Alexander McQueen. I think Alexander McQueen is the modern version. The, the people like Elijah, Alexander McQueen. These are the, the types of people. And I just kind of miss that in fashion. And there's not many people I can look to right now in fashion. Yes, there's people like Yoji Yamamoto um, and people like that, but there aren't too many I can look to that are still like that. Many designers are still on that level. To quote what Moulier said in an interview with British Vogue, he said, it's for my generation to explain to the younger generation what a liar is and bring back sensuality, tailoring, and the ease it had in the 80s. And I feel like you definitely get this sense through the collection. Definitely we have the the body-hugging, tight-fitting clothing that we would associate with a liar. We definitely see their silhouette. We see different takes on leather. And I do like this idea that Mounier had that he wanted to democratize a liar. And what he meant by that is a liar was a brand that sort of went against the fashion system completely. Like a liar didn't, you know, have his shows when all the other runway shows are being had on the calendar. He just used to make things in his own time. A liar was a designer that Eventually, he just got a bit disorientated with the whole fashion system and scene in general, and he sort of became a bit more reserved. And then you could only really find his work in like enclosed spaces and galleries. And it came a bit, not maybe not exclusive is not the right word, but it kind of was exclusive. And I think Mulier thinks that if he's going to reintroduce the brand to a different audience, that's not really going to work for a younger demographic. And I, I do agree, to be honest. And so I think. This year has been a good showcase on designers that are reinventing brands. And also it was definitely a good year for just Raf Simmons and his, his co-collaborators and designers that have worked closely with him. Because even Moulier's partner, Matthew Blasey, was recently announced as the creative director of Bottega Veneta. So yeah, these are just a few fashion moments that I sat down yesterday thinking about making this video and I was like, what, what fashion moments? When I think of 2021, come to mind. Of course, there are many other fashion moments that I think of, but not as much as these. So there's things like, of course, House of Gucci, the movie came out. Um, the Met Gala came back after many years. Um, Nigo from Bape, he, known from Bape, he was the creative director of Kenzo. Um, Chitose Abe um, did, designed, was a guest designer for Jean-Paul Gaultier's Couture. So yeah, there were loads of other fashion moments, but I think the ones I covered are just ones that I personally remember when I think of 2021. But of course, like I said, um, if I left anything out or if there was a fashion moment that spoke to you in particular, of course, comment it down below. Um, these are just like my personal fashion moments. It doesn't mean they're the actual biggest fashion moment. If you want to support the channel and access exclusive content for $3 a month, you can subscribe to the Patreon. The link to that is in the description below. Um, also, I wanted to say, because this video was supposed to be on a, on a positive note, so I wasn't going to talk about, you know, designers that unfortunately aren't with us, people like Albert Elbaz, people like Virgil Abloh, um, so just bear that in mind, um, because I know people are going to start commenting. Um, last thing I also want to say is thank you very much to Daily Paper that sent me this sort of two-piece um, very interesting fabric suit um, because I, I don't really wear colour and I was thinking because I've had this suit for a while now and I was like it's kind of collecting dust because with this COVID thing there's nowhere I'm really going to wear this so I was like you know what I might as well just wear it in videos and show a pop of colour um, but on that note hope you guys like the video subscribe if you're new like the video and I'll be back with another video very soon